This is uh, Robert uh, Stark. I'm uh, joined here with uh, Francis uh, Nally, and we're going to be discussing his new book, uh, Leadism, Board Games That Will Get You High. Francis, great talking to you. It's nice to be talking to you, Robert. It's uh, been a while. Yeah, I remember your interest in board games, and we had a number of guests uh, on the show, including Andy Looney and uh, Peter Loca and uh, James Ernest. They're all uh, board game designers. And each of those designers, uh, their board games are featured in the book. Yeah, well, I mean, there's one thing that's interesting. Well, before I actually even talking about, if you want to say, quote-unquote, politics or anything about social commentary and philosophy, ever since I was pretty much 15 years old, I've played board games instead of video games, which is a very strange thing because most Zoomers and 30-year-old uh, boomer slash millennials, they remember having a Sega Genesis and playing Gunstar Heroes or Super Mario 64, Final Fantasy 7, or even Super Smash Brothers. But I guess I'm the type of uh, Nick Land type of reactionary Luddite where I feel that the most supreme form of gaming is actually board gaming or that a game that takes place in the physical realm than with digital uh, media. I mean, technology can do a lot of things like internet poker and virtual uh, laser tag or, or something like that. But um, the physical, whatever that may take in sports or board games, remains the way to which I think human beings have expressed themselves through uh, games. And uh, I thought maybe I should write a book about um, games, in particular under the philosophy of quote-unquote uh, ludism, and something I recently discovered. How does this book uh, relate to arguments that you made in your last book on a queer culture? Well, the queer culture was more like a uh, uh, kind of a, a pamphlet that you kind of publish like really quickly and you give out to people on a college campus or it's something similar to the abolition the abolishment of work by Bob Black where it's kind of a avant-garde data uh, pamphlet kind of satirical maybe kind of sincere I mean it's more of a creative writing piece I think the ludism book compared to queer culture is more about a specific topic and this is actually my first book on amazon.com previously I was using uh, Lulu out of the advice of Brandon Adamson but if you start to understand that Amazon owns 50 percent of the publishing or book industry then you have to become acquainted with Amazon. Well, there has so, been that issue of censorship and deplatforming on Amazon but I don't think it would impact this book. I would say this is actually my first uh, professional book compared to, I would say, my previous publishings were more like zines or more like avant-garde pieces of work. But I think the Ludism book, using you know Amazon's publishing house and my own formatting and my own editing, I think I've able to make a product that could basically help normies understand the world of board gamings or the esoteric concept of ludism itself. So this book is more for normies than your previous work? Well, it could also be a stepping stone because I, I do use the word queer in it. And I also put queer in quotations, whether that could mean being homosexual or not. But I have still the zine background where... I make the text in typewriter font, so it looks like kind of this old punk zine from the 90s, but as well um, reference, you know, names where I'm not friendly on the normies. I will attack a normative person who likes uh, a particular type of game and who's associated with that. But I think the thesis, or what I argue, the thesis of ludism what exactly is the philosophy of Ludism, and is there any uh, connection to the Luddites? Well, Ludism is a term coined by uh, Ron Hale Evans, 
who graduated from uh, Yale University. Uh, I think he was an English major, but I'm not so sure. He started a obscure website that's now out of date or obsolete. It's called ludism.org. And he actually meant the word ludism as ludo for game and not, not actually Luddite. But that's kind of funny. There's an irony there where he argues and kind of has wordplay on ludism.org where in the manifesto he says that this kind of board game religion will create this kind of DMT LSD experience that computers and technology cannot do and that we're kind of reaching for the glass bead game as in uh, Herman Hesse's uh, He Stay or whatever uh, his the novel of the same name and so really uh, Ron Hale Evans is trying to create a religion based upon peculiar board games like Cosmic Encounter Oh, so not just any board games, more kind of a uh, more specific, uh, specific kind or a niche of board games. Exactly. These games are basically what I wrote them out as board games that will get you high, kind of in the same tradition as um, uh, Edward, uh, I think Rosenthal's uh, board game. No, it's uh there's a book by Edward Rosenfeld called The Book of Highs, 255 Ways to Alter Your Consciousness Without Drugs. And I really liked that book a lot. Oh, so it's not, it's not so much like a meme you're talking about literally getting high playing board games without using any drugs. Exactly. And Rosenfeld, in The Book of Highs, talks about ways to alter your consciousness without getting drugs. And he says things like modular synthesizers or running out in the park or doing listening to experimental electronic music or finger painting or whatnot. So and does it have to do with uh, hypnosis? It can, yeah. Um, the, the feeling of hypnosis can get you high, and there's many ways you can alter your state of consciousness. And this is actually what Andrew Looney Andy Looney does in his designs as well, and his pyramids are kind of this esoteric way of understanding game design not only as uh, a systematic, you know, uh, mathematic formula of moving chess pieces, but an altered conscious reality of seeing new visions and ways, which kind of only uh, games can do, and it's little researched on. And I think Ron Hale Evans in ludism was trying to recreate that but no one knows about this project and so what I tried to do in this book was to resurrect Ron Hale Evans concept of ludism and those said board games that will get you high as kind of this clash between you know Edward Rosenthal's the uh, book of highs and Ron Hale Evans ludism and really I'm just resurrecting his work for a mainstream audience is there other material in this book that does not have to do specifically about board games, such as uh, politics or philosophy? Well, for political politics-wise, I make the argument talking about uh, how capitalism, as much as I rail against it, makes the normal consumer not see can, or cannot get high off board games because under consumption, like you're eating a McDonald's cheeseburger, you just eat the burger, you discard it, and that's that. And that's unfortunately the state of the board game industry, is that all these games are coming out to be consumed, played three times at once, or whatever, and then thrown to the side in favor of something another. There's a uh, professor I love by the name of Louis Pulsifer, and he talks about that back you know, a few decades ago, people had favorite games like chess or bridge or monopoly and they just played those games for the rest of their life or they became good at them today we have this market called the quote unquote gamer who wants to be good at everything or doesn't have a favorite but has multiple eclectic favorites and um the only remotely favorite thing today millennials like is super smash bros but that's kind of a postmodern video game that sells you more alienated Asian Aryan uh, anime character. 
things like that. No, I'm serious. That's what it is. And so board games, it's it's not Asian because it's a very Western thing, the history of uh, board games. And so it, it's, it's people, ludism, what it argues is that I try to list at least 200 or 199 entries of classical games people have had a cult following around and make a lifestyle based upon these obscure board games that I list in alphabetical order. And I played each game I listed in this book and provide my commentary on this. And um, everything what I write about the problem about the board game industry and some of my social commentary is written the first 26 pages. And the rest of the book is pretty much just an alphabetical introduction with a little tick box just telling normies what board games they should really play in order to expand their mind to understand ludism. Uh, who is uh, Howard uh, M. Fessler, and what is the complete uh, strategist? Howard was somewhat of the manager at the complete strategist in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, when he was alive. He, he actually died a year ago, but when I was... Uh, I guess 18 or 17 around that age I would uh, you know I was just discovering board games you know my I, I believe I went to the store when I was 15 before that but when I was getting around you know 20 years old and I, I kind of met my first girlfriend there I that was my spot I, my spot was the complete strategist and uh, king of Prussia and this old man named Howard Fessler, he was the game master, and he was a very mysterious figure, and I kind of had a relationship with him, and then he just died out of nowhere. Um, he had a stroke last year, and so a lot of my communal uh, good and positive experiences with four games has to do with this little game store in King of Prussia, but... Uh, Again, it's I still go there to get my games, and uh, there's another manager there. But um, yeah, that's another thing is that the board game store is basically an outdated relic of the past. Uh, kids, you know, these days download their games. They don't go to a store and play with strangers. And uh, but you know, I reference the complete strategist so actually in Almanized Baby Face, my work, my first work of fiction, oh, and as well. Oh yeah, well, no, you you reference. Uh cosmic encounter in that book well that's in trip i, I oh I, right you reference cosmic encounter in trip and then you reference the complete strategist uh in almanizing baby faced and actually me and matt did a little documentary where in the second part or third part um i believe the second part oh yeah yeah i saw that on Star i was TV. actually showing my uh patrio and uh and frank uh, yeah my... i remember that in the complete strategist, so um, that's something of interest as well. There's are all just basically experiences that happened to me almost a decade ago, but now when I look back at the store, it's kind of like a dying relic of the past. So, in a way, I dedicate the work to him because Howard is just another. I don't want to say he's like a nihilist, but he's just. Just the, again, he was the, he was the wizard at the complete strategist and kind of the quote unquote grognard, which people, you know, I wish more was written about him, but he's just an obscure figure in an obscure time, and so it's queer. If you want to say quote unquote queers like that, that deserve to have a, attention, really. Well, yeah, you do reference the word uh, queer a lot in this book. What is the relationship between uh, queer culture and board games? Well, I mean, board game, I mentioned this in the very first page of the book, is that board game culture, similar to white nationalism, attracts the worst type of people ever. Because, I guess, this, I mean, what is the stereotype about the players? It's usually that they're like nerds or incels? All of that, yeah, or uh, kids with Asian girlfriends and pimple face and social issues, and they think they're anime characters really bad stuff or they're just delusional and they have the Dunning-Kruger effect and they want to go on rants about how they're intellectual but really they're using this kind of outdated medium as a way to socialize and so that's actually why I've been attracted to board gaming 10 years ago and still today is because whenever I go to these board game meetups with strangers they're always the most dysfunctional and mentally ill people and yet 
This is also, ironically, the place where I met my first dysfunctional girlfriend and my second dysfunctional girlfriend, and now my latest girlfriend likes board games too, and so I don't know if I'm plagued by this um, terror or something, but it's just a fascination cultural anthropology study. Um, I think the relation is, yeah, eccentrics do play board games, but I'm such an eccentric that I wrote an entire book to discriminate and prefer a new type of centric, meaning the ludists or people under ludism that play particular games like Cosmic Encounter, Talisman, or Andy Looney's uh, games where they're kind of the pinnacle, the glass bead games, if you will. Would you say that the people who play those games such as Cosmic Encounter, is it a different crowd than the people who go to the general board game meetups? Yeah, I, I I call them grognards. They're basically people much older in their 50s or older, or at least this type of hippie individual where they have this kind of Boyd Rice, Sean Partridge aesthetic of the past, but they like talking, they like getting high off board games. They're, it's kind of a drug effect for them where playing Cosmic Encounter with its random mutators and whatnot they get an experience that cannot be copied in any other uh, game format. And um, I feel the same way, too. I think there's a form of intellectualism being played with games under ludism. I mean, I, I said this, that normies, you know, they are what they do. If they play games like Dead of Winter, Mice and Mystics, or Settlers of Catan, the chances are they're going to be boring people. They don't have much to say. It's kind of like a... Kind of like Sargon of a cod compared to like Greg Johnson of Countercurrents. It doesn't make any sense. It's it's this type of intellect versus the the normie, the cliche normie you heard. And so it really, I'm talking about a aristocratic form of gaming as well because I really, you know, as much as I don't like playing games with certain people. I've also written this book for basically normies when they ask me, do you like board games? And they're acting like hipsters, assuming that I play like well, a certain... So, yeah, game. you do see that with a lot of kind of nerd cultures where the hipsters come and adopt it, at, like the queer culture, and they adopt it for ironic value, but then they end up they end up enjoying it and getting engaged. And they kind of, oh, I don't know if you could say co-opt it and make it theirs. Do you see that same phenomenon in uh, board game culture? Yeah, I mean, again, there's some games that only normies will play. They will play what's the top, the hottest on board game beat geek. They'll only play games like Superbia, uh, Power Grid, Azul, really type of boring generic Euro games that benefits a STEM major, and they're afraid to play Cosmic because... I guess, quote-unquote, it's too random, or role-playing games in general, unless their favorite YouTube celebrity plays it. You mentioned Euro games, or what exactly is that? Well, that's a, that's a long definition, because Euro games, in a way, were kind of the dominating force, or at least started the creation of the modern board game industry for adults, quote-unquote. As opposed to Candyland or Shoots and Ladders. Oh, like, yeah, like, yeah, the children's games like uh, Candyland and Shoots and Ladders. and Yeah, those have been around for quite some time, but when was the shift over to adult games? There's been a lot of argument, but I think it really started to actually, you could actually argue in the 60s with game American game designers like Sid Saxon. He had games like Acquire and Bazaar, where these were games based upon Another feature of Euro games, who has the highest point value wins the game. And Sid Saxon, he was just making friendly, new uh, competitive games of math, and they're fun. I actually really love Sid Saxon's designs, but I really think the first Euro games were Sid Saxon's Acquire and a little known game by Wolfgang Kramer called Heimlich and Co. And Heimlich and Co. was in 1984, I, I think. and Heimlich & Co. actually took the roll move where you roll the dice and you move around the board, but when you rolled the dice, there was something called a Kramer system where you take the point value system and you move in which directions, how you want to spend those points. And as well as in Heimlich & Co., there was something of this um, 
what they call the Kramer score, where there is a giant square on the board, 0 to 100, where, you know, whoever has the host, most highest score wins. And so, really, the Euro game was kind of invented by two individuals, but um, it really jump-started itself, unfortunately, unfortunately, in 1996 or mid-90s with the Settlers of Catan. And that just exploded actually in 2009 when it became the hipster game that, oh, you don't know what yours are? Play Settlers of Catan. But that was just an irrelevant game that just happened to be popular because I guess it was cool in the 90s and it all you do is roll dice. But yeah, the distinction of the Euro game is basically all choice, no luck, and that being making giant math formulas somehow win the game. But um, unfortunately now we're in an age where there's an inflation of Euro games and the people who are attracted to Euro games are nerdy STEM types who like math and economics. And as much as it's an abstract game of a calculator or numbers, uh, these games are very boring. Um, they basically punish you whenever you make a choice. And there's not enough luck or randomness or at least ex human expression. Everything is basically a non-interactive state where you choose basically things to do which you may be winning but you kind of don't know because it's just a giant puzzle and so that's actually a problem and unfortunately hardcore gamers like that because they want to be it's a contest like a sport like who has the bigger dick or something uh, what's going on with the board game market and is the industry in decline i think there's an inflation right now in the board game market um i remember 10 years ago uh, there was a company by the name of Fantasy Flight Games, and they were getting big at the end of the 2000s because they were reissuing classic board games like Cosmic Encounter and uh, uh, Dungeon Quest and things like that where um, they were making money off of nostalgia of a past Gen X or Boomer generation. Now they've been kind of bought out by Asimodi, a, a giant European board game company, and as well Lucas Films, and all they do now is publish Star Wars products. And the board game industry now has been uh, scattered, kind of like the far right, where the board game industry are a bunch of independent developers, or at least uh, what used to have been a monopoly, Fantasy Flight used to have a monopoly on board games, are now just a bunch of uh, toys and things where people throw money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo of things they might like. And it's just a huge niche of pretty much inflation. And everything and every possible game design has been done. And there's getting little and little room for new innovation and in design. And so that's actually a good thing because this limitation is going to bring in a new era of creating elitism with all these games that are coming out, or at least that there's clone games, and people are going to, you know, choose these particular board games that they want to play, and I list all 200 games, which I believe in ludism, are the games that are probably never going to go away, but at least some variant of these games will be made in the future, because it's very hard right now in the game design field to create something new that isn't a clone of something already on the market or at least uh you know everything game design is very peculiar because all it is is emulation or creating variants off of mother designs and so again it's it's a very hard art to get into but a lot of things have been done before and a lot of the market in the board game industry is there's just too many games out there and there's not enough time to consider favorites and we have to be in a time where we have to choose a game that would represent the glass bead game. Have you thought about designing a board game yourself? My first board game design was in 2012, and uh, it was a very silly design where I used a website called The Game Crafter, where I took a bunch of hex tiles, I believe. I was thematically creating like a green tile for a jungle, a blue tile for water, and I got these bunch of meeples together and tried to create a two-player game where on this nine by nine uh, hex uh, or square board and there's like two other tail tips 
where the players will move across this, um, you know, different color squares and try to reach their exit and roll dice on a three-sided dice or, or something like that. And it was just a very clumsy game design, but I, I kind of like it in a way. I don't know if I'll ever revise it and make a new game, but um, my my latest obsession has been trying to write a... Um, uh, a, a second person game book like the fighting fantasy series by Steve Jackson, Ibbing Levenstone or a choose your own adventure book where there'll be 400 sections and then you have to turn to a certain page and then you get into combat and roll dice and then you, you know, get damaged and you hurt yourself. So and... is this, are you talking about something similar to those choose your own adventure books? Yeah. Like I always felt that the second person narrative, you know, saying you, then I, or they has always been a huge, um, unexplored field, but nobody knows how to do it because it's part game design or part theory of how do I interact with the reader and what methods can I do, you know, such as choose your own adventure. Does the player have statistics? And it becomes like a role playing game and video games already do that as well, but you're seeing less and less of actually books doing it. And a lot of people actually get confused and think that game design actually means uh, a second person narrative. I think those are two different separate fields, but it's very fascinating because a lot of game design is interaction. And a book hypothetically can interact with a player unless the player interacts with the text somehow. So it would be a book and a board game that would be interconnected? That's, that's quite possible. I mean things before. There was a game called Legacy of Dragonholt by Fantasy Flight where it was basically a, a game book everyone read together and just relied on it. But there's older, you know, the whole game books have its own history. And I mentioned the fighting fantasy game books and ludism as a part of a cult worshipped uh, game in itself, ta- making the novel or making the text as this kind of second person narrative with statistics and whatnot. But you know, I believe I can do that. I always want to write a game book, but as for a board game, I always want to create, you know, an interactive game or at least something like Cosmic Encounter. And philosophers like Chris Crawford on his book, you know, The Art of Interactivity or on game design, Chris Crawford argues that all games are based upon this interactivity. And if it doesn't, then it's more like a puzzle or a toy or even as a Keith Bergen has said before, um, what if it's a, a series of ambiguous choices or something? Like um, I believe Sid Meier might have said that as well. But the point is you're making choices in games, and these choices are meaningful, and you also interact with other players. And if a game doesn't have that, then it's just a toy or a, a puzzle, and this seems to be every other game on the market. And games under ludism are highly interactive. They're highly random. You can... Um, basically express yourself like someone on a sports team or whatnot and create your own game and own experience that when you retell your playing experience it's almost like taking a shot of acid or something uh what is the biggest uh flaw in board game designs and can you give some examples of some are these the ones that are kind of uh put out for mass consumption yes i mean I think flaws right now in board game designs is actually following a trend. Ten years ago, there was a game called Dominion, and in Dominion, it introduced something called uh, deck building. And this deck building, quote unquote, mechanic was not something where in Magic: The Gathering you build your own deck, or at least you draft the deck and then you play it against another player. This was basically a, a game where you would choose cards out on the field. They would get shuffled to create a bigger and bigger deck until you won the game in this Euro style. And for the next 10 years, from 2008 to 2018, people made quote-unquote deck-building games, which were clones of Dominion. And this was a fad because it really was targeting this kind of nerdy audience that buys Magic the Gathering booster packs, open them up, and trade cards on the spot. That game was directly made for that scene and that crowd. And, of course, that scene growed up, and they're tired of playing that game. And so these trends, which people try to do, maybe such as the Legacy series, where you try to make a scenario out of, say, Risk or um, uh, you know, Betrayal of the House of Horror, um, you know, and use stickers on the board and whatnot, these are kind of fads or quote-unquote gimmicks. 
And gimmicks, you know, trading card games are gimmicks. They basically try to take trading cards and they try to make a game inherent within them. But gimmicks, it's often been, you know, as uh, it's kind of a foolish thing to assume that game design is nothing more than getting a gimmick and trying to make a game out of it. It's kind of a swindling salesman thing. And uh, I think games are more than just gimmicks. It could be very uh, avant-garde and experimental to make gimmick stuff. Like, you make a game out of a computer printer or something like that. But it all, the problem is it will always be a gimmick. And people are forgetting the fundamentals what Chris Crawford or even Louis Pulsifer says, that games are interactive, they have ambiguous choices, there's always a random outcome, there's no way to master it. It could be easy to learn or hard to master, quote-unquote. And um, games are also are expressive like a Jackson Pollock painting. And this is something that puzzles and Rubik's Cubes cannot do, or even Euros, because once you solve... The math formula, well, you could be doing the same thing at work and crunching in a bunch of numbers. How important is the art and the aesthetic element of uh, board game designs? A lot of board game designers, well, you have to understand that designing a board game is a non-physical, um, abstract uh, system that you can't feel or see, but you can... You, you, you can play it out and feel it, and that's what design is. It's just a, it's a, theoreti- it's a, a thought in your head. And so when you're the designer, it's kind of a lazy position because you're bringing nothing into air. And so what matters is that a lot of some games like, um, well, it's games like Yinch or Zertz and Tamsk, these kind of German-style uh, abstract games by Chris Brunn, they're kind of, you know, there's no theme. They're quote-unquote abstract games. But you can add a theme to these games. You could make it like a feminist, like, cat lady communist game and add whatever <laughs> and make people outraged to it, right? <laughs> you know, or you can make it like the alt-right Pepe vs. Wojak game. Or the Journey of Vapor Island board. You can add any theme, but the theme is not the game design. That comes later. And so there's a lot of young, stupid young people such as Zoe Quinn, who made Depression Quest, who oh, believed, yeah, yeah. I'm going to make a political message, and now I'm a game designer. You can take anything mundane and funny and turn it into a quote-unquote game as long as someone consumes it. But ironically, that is the problem in the board game industry, is because people are stupid and will consume into things from Hellboy the board game to the latest in anything Star Wars, but design itself. And so what I clearly state in Ludism is that we're talking about game design. So you can have any game, including Cosmic Encounter, and make it your own, you know, Starkian version of it. I mean, people have already done Lovecraftian Encounter, or even tried to make a Dune Cosmic Encounter or whatnot. I mean, theme's one thing. But the only thing, if you want to be transgressive about game design, again, I think I stated this in Ludism, is that you have a favorite game, you refuse to play a majority of commercialized uh, thematic Euro games and hipster games that normies like to socialize with people. And you basically, the most transgressive thing you can ever say is randomness, role playing, and the sense of play that normal people cannot control because people hate not being in control when the game master allows all this crazy and modular random stuff to happen. Normies get offended over that. So I think the inherent uh, transgressive nature of board games is the ludic uh, mutator aspect. Or, as I also, in um, at the very end, the appendix two of my book, uh, Peter Lochta had a manifesto of, he called it the Future Pastime Manifesto. And in this manifesto, he put it out nine points of what kind of game he would like to desire. And that those points are, one, it would have no dice. Two, no one would be eliminated. Three, you could have allies or win together. Four, every player would be different. Five, every game would be different. And six, you could attack or compromise. Seven, it would not be of this world. Eight, if you could do that, then I could do this. And nine, a license to cheat. If you add all those nine points together, you can make a game like Cosmic Encounter, or at least a game that's not going to be normie-friendly. Uh, in your bibliography, you mention uh, some books based upon uh, board games and game design. And is this related to the philosophy of Ludology? 
and just in general analytical philosophy? I added the appendix, uh, the bibliography in there to assume that I've done research on the topic of ludism and game design, and I'm not just some, you know, Dunning-Kruger idiot who's basically another nerd trying to say I'm the game master, suck my dick. I'm saying is that there is a discipline in lidology or game design that's actually there are professional books out there, even academic books, that people under ludism should read. And I list actually a couple of books that are very important. And um, some of these books, I believe that, you know, if a normie was to sit across from me and I would ask him, have you read The Characteristics of Games by Richard Garfield? You know, I would expect him to read that book start to finish. I wouldn't want, you know, if he said no, then I know he's not going to be an initiate, initiate to ludism. Um, the most important thing to understand about ludism or ludology is that it's it's two different things, really. Under game studies or g game design or game studies, the, the, it's been segregated into two parts. The ludologists believe, like I believe, in analytic philosophy, game design, you know, a non-physical abstract system in the creation of the game. And the naturologists believe in this theme or that all that matters is the story or a theme and the ultimate problem is that, okay, you can, you know, when you, you can create theme, or like, when, if you create the music for the video game, are you a game designer? The answer is no, you're just a musician contributing music to the, the game production. And besides, most games don't have music unless it's a music game. If you think about it, there's no music chess. I believe all games are silent unless it's a music game. It's recent phenomenon that video games have become the Wagnerian art form of total art where it has to have music, art, and whatnot. And people believe that if I contribute music to the game, that makes me a game designer. You know, that just makes you a part of game development. And so that's the split in the game studies department where you have neurologists believing that supposedly all that matters is the experience or story. And so wait, are you saying that the experience and story is does not matter? Because I... Well, that's, that's the split. What I'm telling you, the split is that ludologists, like I believe in ludo, ludism, I don't, it, that doesn't matter. That's just a, anything could matter. And like I said, anything is all flowing. We can make the Pepe, Wojak, Cosmic Encounter game and make this kind of, and make, you know, and so it doesn't, anything is possible. And so that's a good thing. But there are stubborn people and normies who believe, no, it has to be the Pepe and Wojak game. And all that matters, and that's the problem in the board game industry, or at least in the game studies discipline, is that people are making books about race and gender in game design. If that's even a possible thing, why does that matter in game design? And so it becomes this kind of, you know, I'm not, I don't want to go on this route, but it sounds like a anti SJW rant. But um, I made sure to make a bibliography where we're only talking about game design and creating and analyzing the design of the game. Uh, what is the future pastime um, manifest in? You mentioned that, and what's the significance of that? Well, uh, Peter Alakta, as I mentioned before, is that the future pastime manifesto was something he made up back all the way in the early 60s when he was playing uh, Risk. And during Risk, he noticed that there were problems with this avant-garde French game, is that there was dice, um, he was making alliances with his friends. And throughout uh, Peter Alatka's design and the future pastime team, and games similar to Cosmic Encounter like The Borderlands and Hoax, and whatever, you know, those games, they, again, they, they wouldn't, these, this, this kind of future pastime manifesto, those nine points, really help normative people understand this kind of creation of the basic, you know, mid-70s game and why Dungeons & Dragons was created, you know, why role-playing games came about and what were, like, this kind of boomer, hippie generation were doing. They're kind of the pinnacle points of why Ron Heaven Hales created ludism and the ludist religion and something that a lot of normies are forgetting about. Um, I think it's important to understand... Luda, uh, the Future Pastime Manifesto as it's a way to look at board games as not just, you know, uh, Candyland where we have to get to the end, but rather this kind of political, interactive, 
random mutator, uh, strange uh, DMT experience that it's self-expressive where the person is becoming art- an artist and that the game will, all- will be always different and always a different uh, and always fun in some way or another. Uh, we are at the end of the show. I would like to thank uh, Francis Nelly for being on and check out his new book, uh, Ludism, Board Games That Will Get You High. Oh, well, thanks, Robert. Um, my new book is on Amazon. It's by me, Francis Nally, and the book's called Ludism, Board Games That Will Get You High by Francis Nally, and you can order it now on Amazon.com. <laughs>